was sick and tired Living in a town filled with narrow minds and hate They used to laugh at me Their children called me names I would run and hide Feeling so ashamed just for being born I was just a boy punished for Hello, 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 and thank you so much for tuning in to A Spoonful of Comfort. I am Claudine Jackson. I am your host for A Spoonful of Comfort, reminding you and me that in these troubling times in society that we should be the ones giving comfort. And if we can't give comfort, at least don't give discomfort, because we're sure not getting it from our leaders. So we have to... Um, give comfort to ourselves. And I want to thank the watchers. Thank you for tuning in to A Spoonful of Comfort. Uh, thank the people who have donated to the Purvis Jackson Autism Foundation. We couldn't do it without you. You know, the Purvis Jackson Foundation helps lower income children with handicaps. All children with handicaps need help. But wealthy families can do things for their handicapped child that poor families can't do. So that's what the Purvis Foundation does. We help lower income children with handicaps. And the Purvis Foundation is the reason I do the show, is the reason I write and speak to try to help lower income people with handicaps. So today I want to give a special thank you to veterans. Uh, last week was Veterans Day. But uh, it was mentioned by someone on TV that November is Veterans Month, and I agree. I think the whole month should be for veterans. So uh, I want to salute you veterans. Hope I did that right. And I want to thank you <laughs> for your bravery. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your sacrifice. When we say um, thank you for your service, I know it's not enough. We know it's not enough, but we just want you to know that we acknowledge you. So uh, I thank you for uh, your service. And I have two very special veterans that I want to introduce you to who are guests on the show today. And uh, I have a, a family veteran who, is, who served in World War II. But these are younger veterans, and they're special veterans because they are my grandsons. Whoever thought I'd be introducing my grandsons as veterans? So let me introduce Dominique Holmes. Hello. And Perry Holmes. Hello. And they are going to tell us a little bit about their experiences. So we're going to start with you, Dominique. I'd like to know something about your rank and where did you go? Uh, I was a uh, E-6 Petty Officer in the United States Navy for uh, a little less than 10 years. And uh, the majority of my time I was stationed overseas in Europe, Spain, uh, Germany. I did some time in Africa, a little bit of time in Asia, South America, even here stateside, East Coast, West Coast. So I've pretty much been all over the planet. Oh, all right. Yeah. So did, did your travels make you appreciate our country more? <laughs> I mean, it, was, <laughs> it made me appreciate every country. That's what okay. Did, you know, like every every place is different. But so. some of my travels made me appreciate America more because we're not a perfect country, but we have a lot of advantages that other countries don't have. But, but you know, I think travels can help you uh, appreciate the overall diversity of the world in yes. general. You yeah. know? Yes, that's what I took away from it. Yeah, yes. for sure. It's so, a great country, though. Okay, yeah. Perry, tell us where did you go? Well. I did my training uh, in Texas. I did the medical training there. I was a, a combat medic in the Army, and I was stationed in Hawaii, and I did a, a tour in Iraq in 2004, and then I did a, a shorter tour in the Philippines uh, about a year and a half later. So um, I think it's terrible that we send young people to war. I think it's terrible. Of course, I'm not in control. So... Uh, I have nothing to uh, say about it, but I know that it takes courage, bravery, sacrifice. I know that you all went through a lot, and 
uh, I don't know what you went through that you would like to share, but Perry, we know that you wrote a song about uh, being, what was it, your song? I, I, oh. won't, I won't send that letter, so tell us about the background for your song and how you... Well, I, w I went on um, uh, a songwriting retreat that's for us, ex-military. It's, uh, it's called Songwriting with Soldiers. It's ran by Mary Judd and Darden Smith. It's a really <clears throat> amazing organization that helps uh, veterans find catharsis through, the, through storytelling. And uh, my mom actually found the program and uh, was insistent that I, I went. And um, I got to work with a woman named uh, Maya Sharp. And uh, she's worked with people, you know, artists like Bonnie Raitt and a, a lot of other amazing artists. And we wrote a song about experience. I had wrote like a monologue about experience where uh, a friend of mine died from a roadside bomb. And I was there and it affected my life. And so I, I kind of got to uh, take my time with her to, you know, kind of turn that into something that I was able to, you know, use as art, I guess you could say, which is what the whole experience is and about. And give us the story of your song, the background for it, about the letter. So uh, it's about they when you're deployed overseas, a lot of the times they ask you to write your just-in-case letters to your family, you know, in case something happens to you so that they can mail at home, you know, if something happens. And a buddy of mine had, like, just written his letter and he had just like gotten home from like seeing his two two week old daughter who he had never met before and he was killed by a roadside bomb and I was his medic and it just like affected me and so I kind of wrote a song about like you know saying like I hope I, I was had enough resolve to not want to write that letter and I'm sorry that that happened to my friend after he did so yeah I'm so glad that you didn't have to write the letter what about you did you have to write a letter I know he was Army, you were Navy. Did Navy have you uh, write a letter also? No, I never wrote a letter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and they didn't ask you to? No. I wow. don't think I would even if they did. I mean, wonder why. Oh, because you were in active combat. Well, it's not that he wasn't. Yeah, it's just, it's just at the discretion of like the unit you're with. It's not like a, a yeah. mandatory thing. It's just like a kind of. Yeah, and times have changed, you know, since yeah. when he served. He served in almost a completely different generation than when I served. Oh, it's wow. It's a different type of war. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. It's different. So, I don't know. It's to each his own, you know. I, what I took out of the military was, you know, I, I choose to kind of remember the, the good things, you know, the, all the trips. And yeah, that's what. So, what but uh, unfortunately, some people don't have that, that option. Uh, you know, yes. So. so, I really uh, appreciate all that you did. When I, because I've done a lot of traveling, not as much as you probably, even though you're younger, probably a little bit more than you, but in uh, Turkey and India, when I was in Turkey and in India, there were armed military everywhere. Every building had an armed military person. How long ago was this? About, about six or seven years ago. So, uh, is that what you experienced in other countries? Well, I mean, but I think it, that's completely dependent on where you are in the world. Because one of the things about being in uh, America is we don't have to worry about having armed military standing at air. There has been times. Yeah, there's so, been plenty you know, of times. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, most, the majority of countries don't have to worry about that. And from what I've seen on in the travels, mm -hmm. you know, I've... I've seen that maybe once out of really? almost 50 countries that I've been to. Okay. So. I, I, you know, I think what's even more important, though, is, like, the veterans that are coming home, you know, instead of, like, putting them in uniforms and with guns, like, guarding places with the National Guard, we need to be, like, demilitarizing mindsets now because I think w where we're headed now, it's like we have so many veterans coming home that aren't being taken care of properly and we're still investing more and more money in, you know, like, military spending and everything like that. And it's like, what about the, the veterans who have come home that need help? You know, what about, where's the spending for all of that? Actually, this is what people need to hear from someone that has experienced it and you're you two are young you've got a lot of years ahead of you so did the military prepare you for the rest of life or did it kind of give you some problems for the rest of life it's 
a double-edged sword. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. <laughs> it prepa- oh, it prepares you for anything in life. You can tackle anything once you get out of the military. <laughs> but it does leave you with a... With a few uh, inner yeah, demons, yeah, so, you know, but, in the process. But that's, that's anything in life. So. Yeah, for sure. But, but thanks to our military, we have uh, rights here in this country, like freedom of speech. Speaking of freedom of speech, I will say this, Granny. I do feel that uh, it should be a lot easier for veterans to access certain resources, and there should be more debriefing, proper debriefing, for people who are actually exiting the active duty, you know, status and going into civilian life, because so many uh, veterans leave uh, active duty service and aren't educated on what their resources are and aren't giving any information on how to access them. And I think that's a huge, you know, epidemic. And you have people who get out and go a decade without realizing that they have access to certain services. I know that um, a lot of veterans weren't respected from one of one of the wars. I think it was the Korean War, or whatever. When the veterans came home, people were actively well, Vietnam being too, right? really yeah. people were actively disrespecting them, and I think that's terrible. But uh, yeah, that was Vietnam too. Yeah, was it? Yes. Okay, but the freedoms that we have in America, I experienced. Uh, during the Tiananmen Square incident in, in China when they were fighting for democracy and the army came out and was actively uh, running into the people. But isn't it something that that seems like that's exactly what's going on in Hong Kong right now? That's, exa- that's it. Isn't that something? And w- when the Tiananmen Square incident happened, I had a border from China, my border, Wen Lan. She was from China. Wen Lan and Chan, she? I don't yes. Know. So... She was crying and saying, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. And I thought, here's something happening halfway around the world is affecting my peace of mind because she wouldn't let me sleep because she's crying about what's going on in Tiananmen Square. But when she called her folks in in China and told them what was going on, they didn't believe it. But it makes you wonder what the what, where's the impasse with this whole China thing? Like because you know what's happening is Hong Kong is more uh, democratic. It's you know it's on an island off of the mainland, whereas the mainland China is very communist, and they're trying to you know it's a it's a younger uh, generation on on the island of Hong Kong, and China's trying to force its communist ways onto the the island and all oh, these is that, young people. Is that what yes, the problem is? That's what the problem is. Well, that's is. the same thing from Tiananmen Square years See? ago. So it's just been recycled, but. Her folks in China did not believe this was going on. We're watching it on the news. And they told her, you get to America and you see this soap opera and they're lying to you. So that let me really know about freedom of speech and freedom of the press. That they only saw what the government would let them see. So the people that actually lived in China did not know that this was going on. Freedom of speech, it's so funny though. The media is... It's it's so easy nowadays to just spin things how you want and call it freedom of speech. You really kind of have to sift through the news well, to back find the in, truth. Well, in, back in my day, <laughs> before social media, okay, boomer. the news was the news. <laughs> have you heard, have and, you heard of this okay boomer thing? Yeah, right? I've heard of it. I've heard of it. <laughs> I'll be a boomer. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm in the boomer category. Yeah, I, don't, I, think, I don't know what I, I am. Think, <laughs> yeah, but uh, the, the fact that we can, I can do a TV show. You can get up and sing. We have the freedom in this country to do these things. And so I know that the, the military is part of the reason that we, they have fought for us to have these freedoms. So I really appreciate it. You know, I appreciate freedom of speech. Yeah, and absolutely. I didn't appreciate freedom of speech until I became the parent of a child who cannot talk. And talking is so easy for me that uh, it never occurred to me that there would be someone who couldn't talk and would need someone to speak for him. So that's how I started speaking out. And my husband... Uh, those of you who've seen the show before know that my husband was Purvis Jackson, the bass singer of the Spinners, and the Spinners were Motown acts. And one of the things that uh, Motown taught their artists 
is speaking, but speaking in a positive way, not just singing, but if you're being interviewed, speaking in a positive way. Now, do, you, do either of you want to tell us about anything that's been therapeutic for you since you got out of the service? Oh, yeah. Um, marijuana, for sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because uh, the VA, they, they give you a lot of prescription meds, you know, so, you know, me and him, we both just been pretty yeah. much Oh, I absolutely <laughs> agree with him. I was so. just letting him take the lead on yeah. it. But, you know, I think for me, there's this whole mentality in the military. Like, I didn't really drink for the first time until I was training in the military. And there's a, a really big drinking life where you drink, 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 you work, and then you drink, you work, and you drink. Like, and then you go to war and you can't drink. And the whole time you're at war and you're experiencing these extremely stressful situations, you're thinking, man, I just want to get home and have a beer. I just want to get home and have a drink. And then you get home and you're not properly debriefed from all the trauma that you've went through that you had to hold in while you're on your mission. And then you're not dealing with that trauma and you're drinking. So the military has created this uh, perfect storm of just alcoholics and these people who are, are dealing with just uh, trauma that they've suppressed for so long. And for me, going through that cycle of not being able to get myself together after I got out of the military and discovering uh, marijuana and it just helped me relax, it helped me step away from the alcoholism, it helped me deal with my life in a way where I was able to, you know, calm down and study music and just really get a hold of my life. And so, you know, I, I'm glad it's legalized now because I've talked with so many other veterans who have come home and have went through the exact same thing. And um, marijuana does have a lot of good qualities. I mean, it has been documented at helping cancer survivors and different things. But uh, in the Bible, in Genesis, first book of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 29, God says, I put everything on the earth for your use. I put everything that you need is, is there. So this is a plant. Um, people have abused it, but people have abused everything. People have abused food. Yeah. They have abused liquor. They have abused uh, so, so many Prescription yeah. medications. I think it's about finding a balance. You, you know, it's true. When I first started, I didn't quite get it. It's like with anything, it takes time. And you definitely don't want to abuse it where, you know, you're lethargic, you're laying around all day and everything's like that. But there, there are ways to just use it to help de-stress, to help you calm down. Like, I mean, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, severe anxiety, panic and attacks. I'm not surprised. I mean... It, it's expected. And it really just kind of helps you calm your mind and to just settle for me. I, I, it's helped me change my life. So I, I really, I, but th it is a balance, like you were saying, and you have to make sure that you don't abuse it and you respect it. Right. You, you use things, you don't abuse them. Now, I, what about you? From uh, what helps you? Um. I think since I've been out, yes, the, the thing that told me the most is probably being back around family. Okay, like that, well, that, that's probably I'm glad that's, to hear that since I'm part of family, family. Yes. and I want to let the audience know what these two veterans are doing now, and it still amazes me that I have grandsons who are veterans. I have an uncle who served in World, World War II also, but they are uh, rehabbing and uh, repairing homes. So Perry. Uh, the oldest veteran here <laughs> is uh, repairing and rehabbing uh, my rental property. And uh, Dominique is repairing and rehabbing. Tell us some, something about your properties that you're rehabbing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been a roller coaster, you know, like just like transitioning out of the Navy, coming right back here, and to just like start managing properties and rehabbing and working. Like, it's been a transition, but it's been fun. It's been rough, but uh, well, I'm having a good time. So, <laughs> Well, that's something I greatly admire. He bought a home, and then he bought a second home. And when I saw the second home, I said, they would have to pay me 
And take I have to this say, it was, it was a really great investment because yeah. the area, the Virginia Park, you know, area has really turned around with the whole Motown expansion and then Henry Ford's expansion. Right. And with the de recent development right there on the Grand Boulevard next to the Lodge and also the Pistons Training Center. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the area has really, really, I mean, DeLorean was saying, bro, you got to really look at this area and all the things that are happening here. And it was, it was a really great investment. And also up, up there along Dexter in the Grand Boulevard area, Though there are still a lot of houses on that on Dexter there in that stretch that are really beautiful that'll probably be uh, bought up really soon. So it was really good investment over there too. But but you all have worked very hard. I know how hard um, they worked to prepare house number two for you because when I went in that house, <laughs> I said they would have to pay me. That was it. We should have had an HGTV I, I show. Said, I, transformation. Yes, <laughs> I I would not pay to live here, and I'm glad you mentioned DeLorean. DeLorean is their brother, their younger brother. DeLorean is also, but he's active military. He's in the Army Reserves, and do either one of you know his rank? And did either he's one a, of you tell your rank? Three. He's a captain in the he, U.S. Army. Okay, so. Um, is that above what you two? You oh, yeah. Yes. oh yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I was a, I was a specialist in the army. Yeah, I was enlisted. I was in E6 and Delorean was in O3. Been, so, so yes, sir. If I if me and Delorean were both yeah. in uniform, I, I would have to. Yeah, call how you him saluted sir. them? That's how we salute Delorean. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I am especially proud, and especially, uh, you know, you hear so much about the bad side of society. And you hear so much about what people are doing wrong. And nobody is ever going to get through life without ever doing any wrong. But I think when people are striving to do something, they should be acknowledged. And I acknowledge the fact that what you've been through, of course, I don't know what you've been through, but I know it wasn't fun. I know that being in the uh, military is... Uh, a struggle and some people don't survive do you know that suicide is uh, you, which you probably already yeah. know yes. that yes. a lot of uh, young veterans come back and you but were that, saying they don't get the that services that goes back to the whole resources issue exactly and you know it's just I'll say this it's the the John Dingle VA that I go to in the last 12 years his uh, came leaps and bounds from where it was, ah. you know, when I first started going there. I mean, but I will say that the mental health department is much smaller than I think it should be. And I think, I mean... I, I think it's because it's new. It's still yeah, like but that's one of the main now. things that the, the veterans, well, the, returning yeah, veterans are the, dealing with. It's the you worst know. thing, you know, but... It's, it's, so I really feel like it should be a, a larger department than it is just to handle the amount of, you know... But that then there are resources like the Vet Center that are off campus where if you're a combat veteran, you can go and speak about your experiences and attend oh, that's groups good. and things that's, like that. Yeah, that's good. Getting it out. Yeah, there are there's so many resources there, but that's the issue. A lot of veterans don't know what, what, what the issue, I mean, what the resources are to help them deal with their issues. Now, have you had to use the services at uh, the VA? Yet, I mean, you're you're kind of new. How how long have you been out? Uh, eight months. Eight months. Yeah. So, have you had to use the VA services yet? Uh, I get health care through the VA. So. Oh, all right. But I mean, my appointments already? are already like, they're like a, every year. So. It's like, it's been eight months already. Yeah, eight months, man. It feels like I remember we were just excited him getting home, you know. So it's wow, it's been eight months already. Yeah. So, is there anything that you did during your? 10 years in the Navy that you can share with us? Any of your experiences? Did you jump? You, I know you. Jumping out of planes. Yeah. yeah. Jumping out yeah. of planes. Did you, you were in the Navy. Were you ever on a boat? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, was on a, I was on two, three ships, you know. Oh. Never an American one, though, you know. So I've been on a French ship, a Danish ship, and like a British ship. But. Was that in an official capacity or were you just a yeah. guest? No, I was a guest. I was a guest on there. So I was only on there for like three or four weeks, and then I was going. Oh, three or four weeks. That's. Yeah. You ever been on a submarine? I'm not underwater, no. I, uh, they had submarines um, docked this many years ago. 
they had a destroyer, a submarine, and some other Navy vessel at at Hart Plaza. Mm -hmm. So I got to go on a submarine. Scared me to death. We, we, we're not going under the water. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I, I just recently saw um, a true story about a submarine that was submerged, and and they were they were trying to um, stay undetected, and it showed uh, the waters that they were in and all that. So. Um, it was a big submarine, and the one that I was on, like I said, the Navy brought some ships here just for people mm -hmm. to experience. This was a big submarine, and it has missiles on it. She was like, missiles yes. on it. It has missiles. I I mean, the, <laughs> the, and, do, yeah. and the, the, the people that have to be in charge of the missiles. It had something else other than missiles. You said it with such conviction, Granny. You're like, I oh, mean, missiles. <laughs> yes, I was in shock that there are men underwater in Granny, a ship. Granny, that's what people that do in the missiles. military. That's what the military's <laughs> for, Granny. <laughs> but you're underwater. You too. Yeah. That's the Navy, yeah. Water, military, missiles. Uh, scuba diving. You know. uh, for fun or for your no, job? For, for work. Yeah. For work, yeah. <laughs> I wish it was for fun. <laughs> um, many years ago, talking about the, the uh, freedom of speech and all, there was a military, um, I don't know whether you want to call it an invasion or a landing or whatever, on uh, one of the places that the Navy had sent people. And they were very, uh, it, it was like a secretive mission. and. The people, the soldiers, when they came on land, there were the TV cameras. I mean, they, they've got all their camouflage on and their, they, their faces got mud on it and everything because it's supposed to be secretive. Yeah. And the TV cameras were there the minute they, and they were all so <laughs> shocked. The minute they came up, the lights went on. I said, that's terrible for the TV cameras it's to do that. It's good reporting, though. Oh, oh was it? <laughs> They got somebody killed. That's what they did. No. So okay, anyhow, it's time for us to wrap wrap this up. Thank you so much for being my guest today, Perry Holmes, Dominique Holmes, you, two of our fine, fine veterans, and with the country, we are in good hands. Cool. <laughs> so thank you for tuning in to a spoonful of comfort. See you next Tuesday. When I was 17, I ran away from home and from everything I had ever known. I was sick and tired, living in a town filled with narrow minds and hay. They used to laugh at me, their children called me mate. I would run and hide, feeling so ashamed just for